Europe has its first $50 billion tech company. And the lucky winner is Sweden's very own Spotify. Finally, something that escapes the vast shadow cast over the Scandinavian region by ABBA and cheap mass-produced minimalistic design. But $50 billion isn't an easy amount of money to process. What does that mean in real terms? How and why is Spotify valued at that amount? And most importantly, where does the music and the artists who make it fit into all this? In other words, how do we get here? Founded in 2006, but launched in the form recognizable to us now in 2008, Spotify is the brainchild of Swedish entrepreneurs Daniel Ek and Martin Lorentzen. Now it's worth mentioning that Daniel Ek, much like your generic tech CEO, was preoccupied with creating companies from a very early age. At 13 years old, Ek spent evenings away from school building websites for local businesses. By the age of 18, he was making $50,000 a month and managing a team of 25. His parents only noticed how much money he was making once he started to bring home lots of very large TVs. My point here is that Daniel Ek means business. He was never going to be content for Spotify to simply be a music streaming platform. His aspirations were always firmly in the realm of the tech demigod, the Zuckerbergs, the Bezoses, the Steve Jobs. But speaking of demigod aspirations, in a 2015 press release, Spotify declared itself obsessed with figuring out how to bring music into every part of your life. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your mood. Let's start with some basic history and recite pretty much verbatim from their Wikipedia. Spotify is a platform that provides access to over 50 million tracks, users can browse parameters such as artists, animals, genre from great edit and share playlists, Spotify's own almost a year for the Americans, Australian, Europe, parts of Africa, and make those devices to win events. So far, so informative. To understand Spotify's larger plans, we have to return back to the year 2011. A simpler time, Charlie Sheen was banging seven gram rocks, and the song never meant was playing on my iPod as I went to sleep every night. In September of that year, after initial integration efforts over the previous 12 months, Spotify announced a full and restructured partnership with Facebook, including lots of new features designed to make the experience of listening to music more social. If you're anything like me, you may remember those days well. What your friends were listening to on Spotify would appear on your Facebook feed. Top songs would be aggregated on the music tab and suddenly your taste was made visible to the world. For me at least, these new features had unintended consequences. Suddenly I couldn't listen to my playlist, songs for when I'm missing my ex, without the possibility of my ex seeing me doing exactly that. I couldn't even listen to Parachutes without my jazz fusion obsessed friends shunning me for my lack of taste. Year 9 was tough. Still, Spotify's social media strategy felt strangely intuitive. It doesn't take a wild imagination to envisage the more developed version of this social media strategy. It might be able to highlight things like what new album is hot amongst your friends? What songs have your friends been listening to on repeat for the past two weeks? It's also not hard to imagine how this new social listening experience would provide a new viral growth channel for Spotify. As users urge their friends to download the app, this faux intimate experience of co-listening would then lead to longer Spotify sessions, boosting ad play and increasing subscription retention rate. Which is why it's weird that Spotify seemed to give up almost entirely on this social media expansion over the following five years. Facebook integration was never fully developed and eventually dialed back. The DM feature was removed. Personal profiles on the application were never fully developed. The only thing that remained was the friend activity banner on the desktop app. Could it be that Spotify wanted to preserve the sanctified experience of listening to music? Could it be that a tech giant did the noble thing and resisted implementing a feature that would make us obsess over how to best perform our taste? Well, as you might have guessed, Spotify had an ulterior motive. As it stripped out some of its own social features, the de-emphasis in Discovery Free Friends conveniently put the focus squarely back on Spotify's self-owned playlists. Without friends and social anxieties dictating people's tastes and listening habits, Spotify now had a new way of tying people to the platform. And this time, the power lay solely in Daniel Ek's abnormally hairless hands. The rise of the Spotify playlist is a tale that can be told well in the context of coronavirus. With more people working from home, more people on lockdown, more people eager to use music as a respite from the frankly apocalyptic energy of the past nine months, Spotify has seen an increase in subscription rates up 30 million year on year. So if there is to be an apocalypse, what will the world's Spotify users be listening to as the world caves in? Well, chilled beats apparently. So you may be wondering what the proliferation of chill has to do with Spotify's $50 billion valuation. Does Daniel Ek really just want everyone to relax and roll up a blunt as the world caves in around us? Funnily enough, no. 
Let me remind you of the quote that opened this video. Spotify is obsessed with figuring out how to bring music into every country. And for most people, 100 Gex, Death Grips, Black Flag, that won't be the kind of music you'd listen to wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your mood. But what kind of music does fit that description? Well, Spotify's data suggests that chill music has the best chance of being played regardless of activity or circumstance. You could be washing up, studying, working out, getting ready for bed. And yes, maybe even sometimes you could be you could be chilling, you could be chilling, whatever the fuck that means. The act of chilling, too chill, purveying chillness. Ugh. Spotify has gone as far as to actively classify chill as its own genre. Here are just a few of the chill playlists that you might find advertised to you by Spotify on your homepage. The problem with this, outside of the wanky playlist names, is that it refigures music as something passive. It is only there to facilitate a particular mood, or even worse, to facilitate productivity. This is chilled music to work to, to study to. This is music for every part of your life, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your mood. But Spotify's strategy of boosting playlists doesn't stop with the amorphous mass of chill. The popularity of Spotify's own curated playlists gives them power over the musicians and artists themselves. The attitude Spotify takes towards an artist's music and how suitable it is for their playlists can quite literally make or break an artist's career. I tried desperately to get any musician friends of mine to go on the record about how Spotify's playlists have impacted their career. And surprisingly, nobody wanted to bite the hand that feeds them. Some of you may rightfully say, so what? Back in the day, it was magazine editors or label heads who dictated what got heard. Now it's Spotify. But the problem with this is that artists aren't just competing with fellow artists on Spotify. They're competing with Spotify itself. In 2016, Music Business Worldwide released an article that claimed multiple sources had informed them that Daniel Elk's company was paying producers to create tracks within specific musical guidelines. These guidelines fit certain genres and themes, including peaceful, jazz, and piano-based chill music. The article claimed these producers would receive a flat fee for their work, while Spotify retained the master rights. The subsequent tracks would then appear on Spotify under fake artist names. Once again, to be clear, I didn't want to get sued. Spotify has flat out denied these claims. That said, I would suggest you go have a look at the list that Music Business Worldwide published with these fake Spotify artist names and have a listen to some of the tracks. More recently, Spotify has fucked off artists even more with the announcement of a new payola. Dubbed Discovery Mode, the feature will let artists opt in to a promotional royalty rate. Of course, this rate is lower than the normal one. In exchange, these songs will receive an amplified visibility rate in some of Spotify's algorithmically generated playlists. Considering reports that musicians only receive 12% of the music industry's 43 billion yearly revenue, this is a serious slap in the face. Now, the final piece in Daniel Elk's plan for world domination is not really to do with music at all. Revenue in the US podcast market alone is set to double to 1.4 billion by 2024. Since May, Spotify has signed deals with podcasting giant Joe Rogan, Bill Simmons and the Ringer Podcast Network, DC Comics, even reality TV star Kim Kardashian. Altogether, they've invested over 1 billion into the flourishing industry of podcasts. To give you an idea of just how deep Spotify's pockets are when it comes to podcasts, music critic Ted Gao pointed out on Twitter that an artist would have to generate 23 billion streams to make as much money as they have paid Joe Rogan for his podcast rights. And it makes sense, podcasting would be lucrative. Even though they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on podcasting talent, they'll likely recoup that money very soon. Joe Rogan says his show reaches 190 million downloads per month, meaning on the low end, Spotify could generate $3 million in ad revenue from his show alone. The story of Bill Simmons, however, is even more interesting. The rumours are that Spotify don't just have the rights to Bill Simmons and the Ringer Podcast Network's content. They've also hired Bill to head up the pop culture content strategy more generally, with a particular emphasis on video. The pivot towards video on Spotify's platform has actually been increasingly evident over the past six months. In July, upon the release of Krungbin's third album, the perennially chill Mordecai, Spotify released alongside it a video version of the album. Now, my co-host of the Death of the Record podcast, Ollie, had some pretty strong thoughts on this particular iteration of video content, and he has no qualms with going on the record, so I thought I'd ask him what he thought. 
Right, okay, so there seems to be two different things going on here. The first is the kind of swipe down storylines that have been about for a little while now. And, you know, I'm not saying I've got a huge problem with these. For some artists, I think these, these storylines can be kind of useful. But for Mordecai, it just came across as really patronizing, really annoying. I don't understand why Spotify, the band, Genius, whoever it is, feels that they need to kind of lay the songs out and explain exactly what everything means as though it's gospel. The second thing going on, which is probably having more of a deleterious effect upon my well-being and sanity, are the video interviews that Spotify are trying so desperately to push. I remember they did something similar for Tame Impala's The Slow Rush. After giving that album one listen, I felt quite strongly that experiencing the enhanced version would probably result in me asking one of my flatmates to take me outside and curb stomp me. It's just completely and utterly style over substance. There's all these weird kind of glitchy video effects going on. You know, they're just filming in the barn in Texas with cats running around. Absolute fucking nonsense. But please, never, ever, ever again do this kind of crap. Um, you know, I, I, I... So with Taste Making Playlists, huge social media potential, and their own original podcast and video content, what does the future look like for Spotify? How long before they're valued at $100 billion? And who or what will be the casualties along the way? Well, for all the Marxist soft boys out there who want to collectivize podcast wealth, I have some good news. You'll be glad to hear it isn't all sunshine and roses for Spotify's business model. People who know a lot more about profit and economies than I ever hoped to have said that Spotify has its problems, and a lot of them are to do with its two-tier subscription service. Barons.com describes the model as follows. It's exactly the opposite of what Netflix did. Imagine if Netflix had made House of Cards and Orange is the New Black freely available to consumers. Just download the app in the hopes those consumers would subscribe to Netflix in order to watch non-exclusive reruns of Grey's Anatomy. That is essentially what Spotify is doing, and the market has responded by adding 20 billion of value. So will Spotify even continue its rapid growth into the realms of the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Apples? Maybe not. But what part can we play in this process? What can we do to ensure that Spotify shapes its service in a constructive manner, so that it provides economic justice for its artists, and also a good product for its consumers? Well, in the late stage capitalist society that we live in, there's not an awful lot we can do, but we do have the freedom to make choices with our wallets. Or for all my fellow recently redundant brothers and sisters out there, our universal credit. Look, it is important to diversify the way that you consume music. Don't just listen on Spotify. Buy the vinyl, buy the CD, buy the cassette, go see the band live, go to music festivals, buy artists merchandise. If you are going to download their music, download it through Bandcamp, not iTunes. Equally, diversify the way you consume content more generally. Don't just get everything through YouTube or Google. Go tune into some QI reruns on Dave. See if Ask Jeeves is still up. Most importantly, resist tech monopolies. We don't need these bold bastards getting any more power. There goes our Spotify podcasting deal. Ollie, yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Um, sorry, Elk, Elky, I love your hair, Elky. It's, it's, it's your hissute. Your